Might I inquire your movements today, Watson? Hmm? No, only my usual rounds in the Paddington area, Holmes. And now back here for lunch at the usual time. Uh, surgery late this afternoon and some paperwork in the evening. <laughs> Nothing very special. Why? I've had a note walked around. It's extremely interesting. It reads... Sir Charles Drewings will be pleased if you would receive him at your rooms in Baker Street at 2.30 this afternoon. It is a matter of national importance and extremely urgent. As it comes, as you can see, from the seal on the envelope from the Admiralty. Hmm. Well, I think I understand. The matter will be secret and your meeting highly confidential. You'd like me to lunch in town and come back later? No, hmm? not at all. I believe Sir Charles Drewings is a very shrewd and devious character. I should very much like a witness to this meeting. You will be here to assist me. present the stories of Sherlock Holmes. Lack of evidence. Sherlock Holmes was accustomed to dealing with government departments, but any assistance he was asked to give invariably came through the visits from his brother Mycroft. It was unusual to have a direct request from someone as high up as Sir Charles Drewings. I went about my business and forgot all about the appointment. There were several difficult cases that needed hospitalization, and to my consternation, I found the morning had slipped away. Lunchtime had come and gone, and when eventually I got back to Baker Street, it was nearly half past two. A carriage waited at the curb outside 221B. I let myself in and found Holmes seated in his favorite chair. Opposite him was a tall, distinguished-looking man of rather forbidding appearance. Holmes immediately made the necessary introductions. How do you do, Dr. Watson? How do you do? I am pleased to meet you. But surely, Holmes, you must have understood that I intended this appointment to be strictly confidential. Watson has been privy to almost every case I've ever handled, including the most secret assignments from my brother Mycroft. Mm. Uh, unfortunately, Mycroft is not in England at the moment. Were he so, I should doubtless have used him as an intermediary. He would have welcomed Watson's assistance, I do assure you. You need have no fear of speaking freely in front of a most trusted colleague. Mm. Well, well, very well. The fact is that I have an assistant at the Admiralty. His name is Robert Rivers. He lives quite near here in Upper Montague Street. Or rather, he did. Uh, the fact is that Rivers has simply disappeared. Can't be traced at all. He should have been in the office two days ago. He didn't turn up. No sign of him anywhere. We're very worried. You think he may have met with an accident? Surely he has a family who would have known that. Well, he has a wife. A very beautiful wife, years younger than himself. Uh, they appear to be uh, estranged. Uh, delicate matter. Uh, impending divorce, I understand. And naturally, Rivers wishes to avoid that publicity, but that's not what disturbs me, Mr. Holmes. The fact is that for some time now, we've been aware that certain information has been passing from our office to uh, foreign shores. As you know, we in Britain pride ourselves on our secret service, best in the world. Information coming back to us leads us to believe that someone in the Admiralty has, well, to put it bluntly, turned traitor. I see. And you suspect it's Robert Rivers? It's a grave accusation, Holmes. I, I don't care to put it in as many words, but the possibility does exist. Recently, I've been watching Rivers. Only he and I have the keys to the safe where the codes are kept. It's top secret. The codes are continually changing. Now, I know that Rivers has been at work on certain papers... I am reasonably sure that he has contacts in Austria. Your brother Mycroft is over there at the moment and confirms that information is being leaked out. So you think Rivers became aware that you were onto him and that he has skipped the country with your latest plans? That is what I fear. I yes. see. Well, if he's been missing for two days, he could easily be aboard ship or even across the channel. What does his wife say? Uh, we have not contacted her. She is rarely at his house. The, the point is, Holmes, I, I don't want to call in the yard. 
If this can be handled quietly, if you can obtain proof that Rivers has defected, then our men on the continent will know what to do. At the moment, there is simply not enough evidence. Will you consider taking up this investigation and giving it top priority? Please agree for England's sake. First, I knew Holmes would say yes, and he lost no time in taking action. The moment Charles left us, Holmes reached for one of his files. He speedily confirmed the background and address of Robert Rivers, and, giving me time for a light luncheon, suggested a short walk round to the Rivers' home in Upper Montague Street. In response to our ringing, the door was opened by an extremely lovely lady, and she was quite obviously the wife we'd been told about. Yes, sir. Can I help you? I beg your pardon, madame. But am I addressing the wife of Robert Rivers? I am Irene Rivers, yes. I am Sherlock Holmes, and this is my friend and colleague, Dr. Watson. How do you do? Oh. Oh, Mr. Holmes. Well, of course, I have heard of you. Would you care to step inside before stating your business? You are very kind. Thank you. Please come this way. I presume that a visit from someone as illustrious as yourself must mean that you wish to ask questions about Robert. Uh, please, won't you both be seated? Thank, Thank you. Uh, what makes you assume it's in connection with your husband, Mrs. Rivers? Because he's the only one who matters here. If it is about Robert, then I must tell you that I know nothing. I haven't seen him in months. I'm only here for a few days to collect some possessions. And then I'm about to sail for the United States. I see. If you see so little of your husband, then presumably you know nothing of his movements. Nothing at all. Even when I stayed here permanently and tried to help him, he was totally secretive about where he was going and why. You have no idea where he is at the moment? Well, at his office, presumably. He's not been seen for over two days. No one knows where he is. The Admiralty are extremely worried. They fear that he may have met with some misfortune. Not been seen? Oh, but surely I... Well, I I've only just returned here, you understand. I... I've not even seen the servants. Surely they must know. Well, I believe they have been questioned and can throw no light on the matter. I see. Oh, I wish I could help. I really do. Oh, dear. I hope this isn't going to complicate matters. You see, Mr. Holmes, I am leaving my husband, this time for good. I'm seeking a divorce and leaving for America, where I hope to marry the man I'm in love with. I don't wish to part from Robert as bad friends. When are you thinking of leaving? Well, I have a passage booked on the Ruritania for the day after tomorrow. I see. Well, then let us hope we have good news for you before then. Oh, I ring you, darling. Did you know that... Oh, I, I beg your pardon. I, I didn't know that you had visitors. Oh, that's quite all right. The gentlemen were about to leave. Let me introduce you. Mr. Sherlock Holmes, Dr. Watson. Good this afternoon. is Mr. Douglas Beresford from New York. How do you know? A great pleasure to meet you, Mr. Holmes. Uh, your name is well known, even on the other side of the Atlantic. Oh, that is most gratifying. Mr. Holmes is here making inquiries about my husband, Douglas. I have told him that having just returned to the house after an absence of some weeks... I know nothing of his whereabouts. Oh, uh, yeah, I, I, I see. Uh, well, I'm sorry. Uh, I can't help you either, Mr. Holmes. Uh, Rivers and I hardly know each other. Well, then it's useless to question you further. Uh, may I have a few words with the servants before we leave, Mrs. Rivers? Uh, yes, of course. Be so good as to ring the bell, please, Douglas. Oh, uh, yes, yes, sure. May I leave you my card? You will, of course, get in touch with me if you hear from your husband or can throw any light upon his sudden disappearance. Yes, yes, of course. You rang, madame? Uh, yes, Briggs. Uh, please take these two gentlemen down to the servants' quarters and allow them to question whoever is available and then be so good as to show them to a carriage. You're very good, ma'am. If you would follow me, gentlemen. Uh, thank you. Well, good day to you, Mrs. Rivers. Mr. Bettersford. <laughs> good day. Good day. Irene. Irene, darling, what do they really want? What did you tell them? I told them nothing except that I'm in love and I'm going to America to divorce and remarry. That's all, my dear. Oh, That's all. Really? Oh, my dear. The christening of the servants at Upper Montague Street took very little time. But to my surprise, Holmes asked to be shown out the back way into Montague Mews. He then entered the private coach house. Yes, I see the horse and carriage are not here. All seems in order. The hay, untouched, unused. It rained yesterday, but there's no evidence of it in here, except... Uh, but wait. 
What is this over here? Look. Blood. George, you're all right, Holmes. Blood. And quite a lot of it. Dried blood. Hmm. It's not fresh. Yes, and here there's been quite a violent struggle. The hay, canvas coverings, all buried away. Give me a hand, Watson. Uh, 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 look. A man. A dead man. Hmm. Heavens, Holmes. What a sight. This man's been beaten to death. Yes, it looks as though he's put up a good fight. His hands are much bruised and... And then perhaps when he was down, he was struck violently from the back with a heavy instrument. Look, a coachman's wheel hammer. Shot at the base of his skull. Oh, it's murder, all right, Watson. Holmes, is, uh, is this Robert Rivers, the missing man? No, 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 I think not, Watson. He's a servant. I should judge from his garb that he's a, a family coachman. The poor fellow's dead, all right. Well, that means we shall have to bring the police into this case. Uh, can you please use the telephone, Watson? I saw one on the wall inside the hall. Yes, of Get through to Inspector Lestrade at Scotland Yard. Tell him to come to me or send a man round. Right. <sighs> Meanwhile, I have the opportunity of going over this table before no one else gets here. Now, hurry, Watson, hurry. In less than an hour, Inspector Lestrade had arrived with a police sergeant. Holmes had got the butler to identify the body... It was indeed the coachman Morgan, who had been in service to Robert Rivers for so many years. Lestrade made his own examination and agreed with Holmes. Uh, struck down from behind. Murder, all right. Yes, I hope we don't think this is too small a matter for you, Lestrade. This is the home of Robert Rivers, isn't it? He works at the Admiralty. A murder on the premises of anyone employed at such places has serious undercurrents. I see that the horse and carriage are not here. Is it possible that Mr. Rivers has taken them? Yes, it is possible, but I think you do well to concentrate on this as a straightforward murder, Lestrade. Oh, well, where do we start? Any ideas? Oh, yes, yes, plenty. You're looking for a man of approximately five foot eight inches tall. He has red hair and he has a tooth missing from the front of his mouth. <laughs> oh, you aren't serious. I'm never more so. The coachman Morgan put up a good fight. I see the knuckles of his hands and the bruises on his face. He landed several blows to the head of his assailant. Adhered to the blood on his hands were various hairs. I've used tweezers to place them in this envelope. Yes, the hairs, as you will see, are of a rather vivid red. Uh, yes. Yes, all right, Holmes. Carry on. You'll find there's also a broken tooth in that envelope. I picked it up from the straw. It must have been from the man Morgan was fighting, because Morgan's teeth are all quite intact. Also on the beam of the stable, there are similar red hairs. That shows that the man was hit and staggered back. His head hit the post at roughly five and a half feet from the ground. It is reasonable, therefore, to assume that he is a small man. He must have red hair and a beard. Well, that is something to go on, isn't it? I think so. There must be hundreds of red-headed men in London, but not many who also have broken front teeth. It narrows down the field somewhat. I think you'll find that the killer is a hired thug, experienced in this field. May I make a final suggestion? By all means. Try Limehouse. There is a pub called the Anchor, near the river. It's the kind of place where all the seamen gather. There is a so-called gymnasium at the back. I've long suspected it as being a screen for various smuggling activities. If you get a couple of plain clothes men to dress up as rough seamen, they may be able to pick up a lead on the man you're after. Well... Oh. Yes, all right. I'll follow through on that, Holmes. Thanks. After we left Montague Mews, Holmes went back to Baker Street and I took a cab to my surgery. I had delayed my work long enough. It was now quite dark, but I was able to see the many patients who'd been waiting for me. It was late when I eventually made my way back home. Ah, ah, Watson... I've been stiffing about in Limehouse. The Strades men are there, standing out like sore thumbs. They were in the bar of the anchor, but in a way they helped. They made my own investigations pass quite unnoticed. I found the murderer all right. Oh, you have? Well, who is the man? A most an undesirable creature by the name of Joe Cornfoot. He's a burly, a five foot seven, has red hair and a front tooth missing. I've advised Scotland Yard and the Strades would call him in for questioning. They should be able to get the truth out of him. Yes, but Holmes, even if they do get a confession out of this man, will that help you to trace what has happened to Robert Rivers? Oh, I sincerely hope so, Watson. Well, there must be some connection. An important admiralty man disappears and his coachman is murdered on the same night? No. There must be a link. It all depends on the strade. 
Can he get at the truth? Huh. Well, let's hope so. Oh, well, it's been a long day. I'm forgetting to bed. Good night, Holmes. Good night, Holmes. Now, come on, Cornfoot. Tell me the truth. You ain't got nothing on me, Inspector. What makes you think I'm the man you want? You've got a front tooth missing, haven't you? We've got one that will fit that gap in your mouth exactly. So what? Lots of seamen have got teeth missing. Well, how did you come to lose yours? Well, it must have been two or three nights ago. I was mixing it with another bloke in the gym at the back there. A fella called Max Welder. Caught me one in the face, knocked me bleeding tooth down his throat. Yeah, look, that's Welder's just, just come in. You can go and ask him if you like. I will, later on. Tell me where you were last Monday night between the hours of six and midnight. Well, see, I was... I was here most of the time. Yeah, yeah. The landlord will bear me out. He'll tell you that I had a bit of grub, a few pints, and then I went round to the gym and had a couple of rounds with the boys. And got my tooth knocked out and came back in here until closing time. As a matter of fact, because of me swelling face, Slider, I spent the night right here in one of the rooms at the anchor. You expect me to believe that? Oh, please yourself. Well, I've got a dozen blokes to back me up. Just hold on, Jiffy. Alf Brown is the landlord. Hey, Alf, come over here. Yeah. That's what you well, The inspector here is questioning me about where I was on Monday night. He seems to think I ain't telling the truth. You tell him. Monday? Well, let's see, no, that... That will be the day you want your tooth knocked out, won't it? Right. Yes, you got such a nice supper, too. See you all night, if I recall. Yes. Well, there's Max Welder over there. He's the bloke who copped you one, wasn't right, he? Shall I call him? All right, all right. All right. You're all going to stick together. But I warn you, Alf Brown, this is a serious offence. If you are shielding a murderer lying on his behalf, then you are an accomplice, and you could end by swinging on the end of a rope. Remember that. The next day was spent in trying to destroy Joe Cornford's alibi and continuing the search for Robert Rivers. Both ended in failure. A very frustrated Lestrade called in the late afternoon. Oh, I, I just can't move him, Holmes. Can't make the charge stick. He simply says he's innocent and that's that. But he is not innocent, he is guilty. I've been fetishing away down at Limehouse and Joe's pals are perjuring themselves to protect him. He is guilty and he knows where Robert Rivers is, I'm sure of it. Well, Holmes, I don't know how we're going to prove that you're right. Well, I shall have to take active steps myself. There's no time to lose. We move tonight. First, I want you to send off two telegrams for me. One is to Mycroft, wherever he is in Europe. Oh, I think we should be here to take the responsibility. The second is to Sir Charles Drewings. Then I want you to have your men at the ready down at Limehouse Lestrade. Watson, are you agreeable to accompany me? Oh, yes, yes, of course. Of course. Then it's about nine o'clock we will journey to Limehouse uh, suitably clad, of course. I'm sure I can find old clothes you can get into. A large Inverness cape with big pockets that can contain a revolver or two. So you think it's going to be dangerous, Holmes? We're attacking dangerous men. Let's go prepared. Come, let's get started. Now, the straight, this is what happened. And so, on that rainy, windy night, Holmes and I took a cab to the east end of London. We made our way on foot to the Anchor Inn, but we didn't go in. It wasn't all that late. We waited down a side alley. After half an hour, two men left by the back entrance near the gymnasium. By the light of the gas lamps, Holmes identified them as Joe Cornfoot and Alf Brown, the landlord. We followed them swiftly and as silently as possible. They made their way towards the river, and at Luke's Wharf, they stopped and slipped into a small, disused warehouse. Holmes clutched me by the sleeve and guided me through the darkness. Inside, the two men lit a lantern. There, there you are. You see that kneeling down, look. About to lift up a wooden trapdoor in the floor. Yes, but Holmes, what does all this mean? Sure, 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 sure. You'll find out very soon. Wait, wait. Waste the time, if you ask me. We know we're safe enough. Then we've got to check, though. We can't be too careful. Here, give it on. No, you take that side. Ready? There, yeah, I'm ready. Right. See, still there. Told you. No chance of anyone discovering him under the floorboards. Now all we have to do is put him in the chest. Come on now. Easy, you know. Easy, you know. That, that's got it. Close him in. Uh, right. Now tomorrow he goes aboard the Sea Wolf. Once out at sea, the captain drops the chest overboard and that's that. 
We settle back and start collecting. The rich blokes were going to be nice and rich for the rest of our days. You know, the cops won't give up. They'll still be asking questions. Don't let them. There's a lack of evidence. They can't make any accusations. Stick it. It's worth taking a few risks. Mm-hmm. One risk too many. Oh, what? Don't move. There are two revolvers pointing at you, and both my friend and I are crack shots. Keep them silent, Watson. Let's get this straight in here. I know he's been following us. Why? Yes, well, the game is up for you two. You may have been lucky once, Cornfoot, but you don't need a false alibi for this evening's work. This time you face a charge of murder. The killing of Robert Rivers, whose body you have just placed in that sea chest. Oh, see, you clever swan. How do you ever find out? You'll have plenty of time for puzzling out the answers when we have you behind bars. Ah, ah, Holmes, Watson. I take it you're all right. Yes, there's nothing wrong with us. But our friends here have a lot of explaining to do. You'll find the dead body of Robert Rivers in that sea chest. Take these men away, and then... Oh, I think you can make another another arrest. A bigger fish this time. These are just two sprats to catch mackerel. Come, Watson. They're still important. Holmes and I left Lestrade in charge and took a waiting carriage back to Baker Street. There, we hastily changed from our old clothes, washed ourselves as cleanly and speedily as possible, and at exactly midnight, while the chimes of Big Ben ran out over the city... I heard someone pull our doorbell. It was Sir Charles Drilling. Holmes' welcome was most cool. I have to report that my case is closed, Drilling. The body of Robert Rivers has been discovered. Thank you for answering my telegram by keeping this appointment, but you must have known that to stay away would have been more condemning than to face my accusations. I'm uh, afraid I don't know what you're talking about. Oh, but I think you do. You have been responsible for all of this, haven't you? You are the traitor who has been selling secrets abroad. The secrets of the Admiralty, new improved armory on our warships. You knew Mycroft might easily discover the leakage and who was responsible. So thinking to throw him off the scent, you turned to me. But you have already committed the major crime. Hiring Joe Cornfoot to abduct Rivers. Then you wish to plant further evidence of his treachery by sending Cornfoot back into Rivers' house with enemy correspondence. But the coachman intervened. He was killed. Cornfoot fled. And you had Rivers killed and his body made ready for a final disappearance at sea. You, uh, you will have to prove all this. Oh, yes. I certainly shall be able to do so. In your case, there is no lack of evidence. Uh, Would you care for a glass of brandy while we wait for Scotland Yard? They won't be long. Charles Jones remained quite silent. He refused to make any sort of statement when the Strade and his men arrived to take him away. Joe Cornford and Alf Brown were arrested on charges of murder, and Holmes lost interest in the case completely. It was over a week later when we were sitting at breakfast. Mm. Yes, I see two items of undoubted interest to you, Watson. One is the sudden death of Sir Charles Drewings, of a supposed heart attack. <laughs> How convenient. Well, we won't bother to question that. The other is that Mrs. Irene Rivers has now become Mrs. Douglas Beresford after hearing of the death of her first husband, Robert Rivers. <laughs> ah, well, I trust you have an uneventful day today, Watson. I certainly intend to do so. Listen again next Sunday to The Stories of Sherlock Holmes with Graham Armitage's Holmes and Kerry Jordan as Dr. Watson.